this one gets a little brutal and there are some controversial topics, but I think you can handle it. I am going to be talking about murder and mayhem. In 1974, in the quiet town of Ogden, Utah, two young men entered the hi-fi shop with intentions of robbing it, or they claim they only wanted to rob it. What really happened was the worst disaster piece theater of brutality and unnecessary violence resulting in three innocent lives lost, a bright future utterly destroyed, and outrage from well-meaning but misguided do-gooders. Ogden is a haven for nature-loving hipster Mormons. It does have a bit of a rambunctious past though. After taking a walk on the notorious 25th Street, Al Capone was overheard saying, this town is too rough for me. <laughs> I guess Ogden leaves a lasting impression on visitors and residents alike. Snuggled up to the foot of the Wasatch Mountains in northern Utah, Ogden is a captivating city that offers a perfect balance of outdoor adventure, rich history, and vibrant culture. The population sits at a nice, not too big, not too small, 100,000 people with its a adorable downtown lined with historic buildings, art galleries, and trendy shops. So there is some crime there, a little higher than the national average. The town's motto seems to be, well, we're not as bad as Salt Lake, which does seem to have a much higher crime rate. And who knew? What goes on in Utah? Oh yeah. One of the most heinous crimes in Utah history. Here's an audio file. Remember the, the, the noise they were making, the sound of, you know, the sound of pain, really. Design our high fidelity components. I'm very ashamed of my participation in that crime. It's impressive realistic hi-fi. I figured in a shot Mrs. Nesbitt and just had to shoot everybody else. If you want to buy audio equipment, come to Sound Chamber and we'll show you why. At Hi-Fi for Fun, you get more for your money. April 22nd, 1974, in the relatively peaceful town of Ogden, Utah, as the sun dimmed and the day was drawing to a close, the lives of several innocent people were about to be irrevocably changed within the walls of the hi-fi shop at 2309 Washington Boulevard. Two young employees, 20-year-old Stanley Walker and Michelle Ainsley, who was just 18, were wrapping up their day when they suddenly found themselves in a horrifying hostage situation orchestrated by the vicious, albeit sloppy, Dale Pierre and William Andrews. The horror was amped up when unsuspecting 16-year-old Courtney Nesbitt, who had just been out running errands, wanted to briefly pop in the shop and thank employee Stanley Walker for allowing him to park his car in the hi-fi shop's parking lot while he went and picked up some pictures that were ready for him at a nearby photo shop. That's a fairly conscientious young man right there. The three hostages were corralled and tied up in the shop's dimly lit basement. Now, I'm not here to tell criminals how to crime, but if you find yourself holding up a hi-fi shop, knowing that transporting that equipment, which back in those days was huge, the speakers that we listen to now might be five inches tall. They would need to be five feet tall back in those days to duplicate that sound. So moving the stuff from the store into your van waiting outside is going to take a minute. Lock the door. But they didn't. They also didn't really feel a sense of urgency. Two hours had passed since the closing of the hi-fi shop, which was when the robbery began. I mean, hurry up. The situation spiraled further out of control when Stanley Walker's father, 41-year-old Orrin Walker, had become concerned about his son. So he went to the hi-fi shop to see what was taking him so long to get home. So when he got there, the door was open, he walks in, and he's soon thrust down into the basement with the other captives. Orrin was terrified 
while he heard Michelle Ainsley pleading for mercy in that dark basement. But it gets worse. Doors still unlocked. Courtney Nesmith's mother, 52-year-old Carol Nesbitt, she enters the shop looking for her son. Then she too was bound and brought to the basement with a growing number of captives. And that's really not what you want. I read one report that said this was the point at which the door was finally locked. But I have a feeling that the perpetrators and the public both just got lucky. Now, these five seemingly nice, regular people were trapped in this dark basement with two monsters. Along with 19-year-old William Andrews and 21-year-old Dale Pierre, outside manning the getaway car was 19-year-old Keith Roberts. And now, Andrews and Pierre had a problem. What to do with the witnesses? I don't know why they didn't just grab their enormous speakers, receivers, console stereos, and just leave, but I have an idea. Dale Pierre was a psychopath, a junior serial killer in the making. He didn't want to just do a smash and grab, or get quick cash or things he could sell. He wanted pain and he wanted torture. And William Andrews had that covered. And like a bartender from hell, Andrews retrieved a bottle of Drano from the van and proceeded to make drinks. Drano. If you don't know, that is a very caustic and corrosive drain cleaner. Now the victims were told it was vodka mixed with sleeping pills, but it did not take long for them to figure out that that was not what it was. Andrews, who had casually known Stanley Walker, walked up to him and said, you have a gun pointed to your head. Drink this or I'll blow your head off. You see, William Andrews had watched a movie and that movie was a sequel to Dirty Harry called Magnum Force. And in it, there was a scene where someone forced Drano down the throat of another. You didn't give me a chance. Chance? Bitch, you had your chance. That was your last chance. Everybody else in this town threw your black ass out. Help me! <laughs> And while it looked painful, it did seem like a clean and easy death. It's actually not. As you may already know, human anatomy has very little in common with the PVC J-Ben under your bathroom sink, your P-trap, nothing like it. Now Drano, once in contact with water, like the moisture in your mouth, your stomach, your esophagus, it will start to dissolve that flesh very quickly. It causes an exothermic reaction and heat is given off as a byproduct. So instantly oozing and bloody blisters will appear around your mouth, in your mouth, and down your throat. If there's a more painful way to go, I can't think of it. Actually, I can't think of anything else right now. Now, although it was dark in the basement, Orrin Walker could hear the screams of agony from the other victims. And this stud, despite the unbearable pain and the terror, was able to turn his head and let the Drano dribble out of his mouth, let it run down the side. He then had to mimic the sounds of agony coming from the others, one of which included his son. Since nothing ever turns out like the movies, Anders didn't get the clean and easy death he was hoping for. The victims were spitting out or vomiting the Drano. So he thought he'd give it another try. So what he did was he tried to pour in the Drano and put duct tape over the victim's mouth. The problem was the tape wouldn't adhere 
to the oozing pus and blood coming from the blisters. I'm gonna stop right here for just a second to acknowledge that finding the actual facts of this case was a lot like chasing a slippery pickle around your plate. Police believed as many as five or six participated in the robbery. Various reports stated that four men had entered the hi-fi shop. Andrews and Pierre were notoriously tight-lipped and various reports told the rest of the story in various different ways. William Andrews claims that at this point, he left the basement and did not participate in what came after. Now, according to court records, this is true. Although, like I said, any number of media reports will tell you that he was there. After the Drano debacle, Pierre grew frustrated that his victims weren't dead yet. <sighs> How inconvenient for him. So using a 25 caliber borrowed from getaway driver Keith Roberts' roommate, Pierre shot Courtney and Carol Nisbet in the head. He then shot at Oren Walker, but missed. He fatally shot Oren's son Stanley before going back and shooting Oren again. Dale Pierre then takes Michelle Ainsley to the corner of the basement and orders her to undress. Then he assaults her. He drags her back to the rest of the captives and before fatally shooting her in the head, Michelle says, I'm too young to die. Despite being shot, Oren was still alive, but Pierre was out of bullets. So he found a piece of wire and tried to strangle Oren. When that didn't work, and this is a lot, this is gonna be a lot, Pierre got a ballpoint pen and kicked it into Oren Walker's ear. He then stomped on the pen until it exited his throat. That's horrifying. About three hours later, Oren's wife and his other son went to the hi-fi shop to look for Oren and Stanley. Oren's son then heard strange sounds coming from the basement so he broke down the back door while Mrs. Walker called the police. One of those called to the scene was George Throckmorton. He was a forensic crime scene specialist for the Ogden Police Department. He said, quote, when I got there, there was a man with a pen stuck in his ear running around. Sadly, Stanley Walker and Michelle Ainsley had already passed away. Carol Nesbitt was rushed to the hospital but didn't make it. We could use a break. You're a good girl. Okay. <laughs> okay. Courtney Nesbitt, despite not being expected to survive, managed to pull through. Although he did suffer severe brain damage, he had to stay in the hospital for 266 days, but managed to return to high school and graduated in 1976. He would have lasting pain though and struggled with stilted speech and had trouble walking for the rest of his life. I lost myself, my identity, and they affixed to me a new identity, which not very many people can associate with. Oren Walker had also survived, but he had suffered extensive burns to his mouth, esophagus, and stomach, and of course his ear was damaged by that pen. Despite his injuries, Oren was heroic enough to provide a description of the perpetrators. One of them was a short-statured, bespectacled black male with a Caribbean accent. Later on, this person was obviously identified as Dale Pierre. Now, maybe if you're committing a robbery in Utah and you have a Caribbean accent, don't talk. Within hours of the crime hitting the news, a tipster called police and mentioned that fellow airman William Andrews had told him of his plan to rob the hi-fi shop and not only that, but said that he would be willing to kill anyone who got in his way. 137 Ways to Get Caught, a detailed step-by-step -step guide by William Andrews. About 5 p.m. the following day, Tuesday, April 23rd, two teenage boys were rummaging through a dumpster at Hill Air Force Base. They were looking for soda bottles to recycle. I remember doing that. 
you brought them back to the store and they gave you like a nickel or a dime. Then you could buy some candy cigarettes. <laughs> what they found though was the wallets of two of the victims, Michelle Ainsley and Courtney Nesbitt. The boys recognized the names from the news and they immediately called the police. Detective Deloitte White arrived at the scene and he immediately sensed that the killers could be among the growing crowd of airmen. So using tongs, he dramatically displayed each piece of evidence that he dug out of that dumpster with theatrical flair, doing the most. Now, as he did that, he noticed that most of the personnel were still and solemn, pretty quiet. However, two individuals at the back of the crowd, they caught his attention and it was Pierre and Andrews who were visibly agitated. They were pacing around, speaking loudly with frantic hand gestures. 137 more ways to get caught a detailed step-by-step -step guide by William Andrews forward by Dale Pierre. Detective White said of Pierre, I knew he was a suspect in another homicide. So he decided to bring Andrews and Pierre in for questioning. Dale Pierre, who was 21 years old at the time of the crime, would later change his name to Pierre Dale Selby. He actually changed his name 27 times. I don't know. Anyway, he was a short, bespectacled man who spoke with a Caribbean accent. He lived in the barracks right next to the dumpster and had been known to hang out with William Andrews, who was 19 at the time. <laughs> it took no time at all for military authorities to give detectives permission to search those barracks. During that search, officers found a list. The hi-fi shop was listed, Inkley's, which was another electronics shop, was listed, along with various high-fidelity information on types of electronics and equipment. Officers also found the cellophane wrappers that used to go around records, and they had this sticker on it that said, the hi-fi shop. Now, while this further confirmed that those two were suspects, it still wasn't quite enough to take to court. But still, calling it a day, officers were about to leave when one of them had the good idea to lift up the carpet. And right there, under the carpet, was a contract for a storage unit dated the day before the robbery. <laughs> Pierre had gone down and rented a storage unit like almost right next to the hi-fi shop. Both men were arrested and in Pierre's pocket, officers found a ring of keys. One of those keys fit the military type padlock on the door of the storage shed. The owner of the storage shed identified Pierre as the man who rented the unit, ostensibly to store a Corvette. Yeah, right. <laughs> a search warrant was soon issued for the storage unit where stereo equipment, which was later confirmed to be stolen from the hi-fi shop, was found. Also, a half bottle of Drano was found. After doing something that horrific, yeet the Drano. Pierre, in my opinion, kept that bottle as some sort of twisted trophy or souvenir. A few weeks later, after a thorough questioning throughout the Air Force Base, a third airman, our getaway driver, Keith Roberts, was taken into custody. Pierre, Andrews, and Roberts were facing some serious charges. Three counts of first-degree murder and aggravated robbery. Survivor Orrin Walker stepped up as the star witness for the prosecution. While Courtney Nesbitt couldn't testify because of amnesia caused by his injuries, his dad, Byron Nesbitt, did give his testimony. And if there were any other people involved in the crime, they were never identified and never brought to trial. On November 20th, 1974, Pierre and Andrews were given three death sentences, one for each victim. Later, at his clemency hearing, Pierre said, quote, The crime took a course of its own. It wasn't planned that way. People kept coming in and I just panicked. 
Of course, the alcohol and the pills I was consuming didn't help. Everyone has a limit beyond which they won't go. Drugs, etc. can alter that limit. I tell myself you have to accept responsibility for it. You did it. You were there. You can't rationalize it. End quote. Yeah, that's some nice clemency hearing. Blah, blah, blah. And so on and so on. scooby dooby doo I guess it's nice that he accepted responsibility, but I don't really see a lot of remorse there. And that's your clemency hearing. Andrew's kind of tanked it for him, though. He said at one point that he never saw Pierre using drugs or getting drunk. Oren Walker also testified during that clemency hearing. He called Pierre a sadist. He said he deserved to die, saying, quote, After he shot Mrs. Nesbitt first, then he was kind of prancing <laughs> or walking in a manner that I got the impression he was kind of enjoying what he was doing. End quote. Prancing, though. It was a good choice of words. I mean, I'm getting the imagery. Walker also said that his younger son was traumatized by his older brother's murder. He slept on a mattress in his parents' bedroom and he refused to go into the basement of their house. Walker also said, quote, most of my wife's time is spent in bed trying to forget, end quote. Now, Andrew's death sentences were especially controversial because he claimed that he did not directly kill any of the victims, although he did admit to forcefully administering the Drano down their throats. And it was revealed in court that he had said to witnesses that he planned to rob the hi-fi shop and he planned to kill anyone that he came across while doing so. The NAACP and Amnesty International campaigns to commute Pierre and Andrew's sentences. The NAACP demanded that Pierre and Andrew's sentences should be revoked because of racial bias at the trial. They noted that the defendants were both black, while the victims, judge, and jury were all white. And according to Amnesty International, the sole black member of the jury pool was preemptively stricken by the prosecution during jury selection. However, it was revealed that the juror was dismissed because he was a member of law enforcement and knew everyone who was connected to the case. In addition to that, the prosecution maintained that the jury pool made perfect sense because of Ogden's demographics. It's Utah. There's a lot of white people there. A lot. Andrews was quick to jump on that bandwagon. He also accused the judicial system of racism. In an interview with USA Today, he claimed that he had never intended to kill anyone. This was later rebutted by detectives when they cited a statement by Andrews in which he admitted to being the one who purchased the Drano and brought it to the store. It was also alleged that a handwritten note was passed to a jury member while the jury was at lunch. The note said, hang the n-words. Now the juror did immediately report this to the bailiff. The judge refused a request for a mistrial and a right to question the jurors concerning the note. Sketch? Yes. And the person who wrote that note and gave it to the jury is the worst kind of knucklehead. However, William Andrews ain't the one. He is not. No, he is not the one. I really think there is a problem with racial bias in our justice system. Not that long ago, there was an execution in Missouri that I believe was influenced by racism. It's so frustrating that this case didn't get the attention and the outrage that it deserved. It's tragic. And I'm saying there were some serious mitigating factors that should have been taken into account when considering this Missouri case, and they just weren't. Although, Oren Walker testified that only Pierre shot the victims, Andrews was up to his eyeballs in this. And Oren had just been forced to play chug-a-lug with a bottle of Drano. Then he was shot. It is not unreasonable to be kind of met on his testimony. 
it's not unreasonable to debate whether or not Andrews was a willing participant. The Drano was purchased by Andrews. It was brought to the hi-fi shop by Andrews. It was administered by Andrews, who wanted to recreate this horrible scene from this movie. He had been talking about robbing the hi-fi shop for months, and had those victims not been shot, the medical examiner at the trial said they most likely would have been dead within 12 hours anyway. Should Andrews get a pass because he's not very efficient? I'm not a big fan of the death penalty. I don't think that the government should be in the business of killing its own citizens. But it was legally applied here. He put the dime in the jukebox. Now he's got to dance. He actually put a lot of dimes in that jukebox, way more dimes that was necessary in that jukebox. This crime that he took plenty of part in was especially cruel. A 16 year old witnessed his mother's execution. A father watched his son die. There are other people out there who have suffered from an unfair justice system. Focusing on Andrews as the face of injustice, that just takes away their pain and their struggles. We need to address and fix the systemic issues that contribute to racial bias rather than just pointing fingers at one person's case. I said what I said. The other prisoners on death row were not fans of Andrews and Pierre. In 1977, on the way to face the firing squad, the notorious Gary Gilmore was reported to have said, quote, adios Pierre and Andrews, I'll be seeing you directly, unquote. I don't know, did Gary Gilmore really like anyone? Still a harsh thing to say. Pierre was 21 at the time of the crime. He was born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago and moved to Brooklyn, New York at the age of 17. In May of 1973, he entered active service with the United States Air Force. In September of 1973, he was transferred to Hill Air Force Base. Almost upon arrival, Pierre became the prime suspect in the October 5, 1973 murder of Edward Jefferson, who was an Air Force Sergeant at Hill Air Force Base, although police lacked evidence to charge him. At the time of the Hi-Fi murders, Pierre was out on bail on car theft charges from a Salt Lake City car dealership. Pierre was busy. That's a relatively short time to kill four people and be brought up on car theft charges. On August 28, 1987, Pierre was executed at the age of 34. At the time of his death, he bequeathed all his money, $29, to Andrews. Pierre declined a last meal. Instead, he spent his final day fasting, praying, singing hymns, and reading the Bible. I probably would too. His last words were, thank you, I'm just going to say my prayers. Can't blame him for that. Andrews was just 19 years old at the time of the crime, and like Pierre, he was a helicopter mechanic at Hill Air Force Base. Andrews had a date with the needle five years after Pierre on July 30th, 1992, at the age of 37. He had spent 18 years on death row, and at that time, that was an unprecedented length of time. His last words, spoken to the Deputy Corrections Director, Bruce Egan, were, Thank those who tried so hard to keep me alive. I hope they continue to fight for equal justice after I'm gone. Tell my family goodbye, and I love them. After being strapped down on the gurney, Andrews lifted his head and said, I love you. Bye bye, just before the lethal injections were administered. Now, Keith Roberts did not receive a death sentence. He had also been 19 at the time of the crime and admitted that he eagerly participated in the robbery, but he thought it would be done when the shop was closed and no one would be there. Roberts also claimed that he had had some dental work done earlier that day, and after waiting a while for Andrew and Pierre, he started to feel unwell, and so he went home. I can't say I don't believe that. They got there at closing time. 
it's reasonable to believe that Roberts thought no one would be there. He had also been kept waiting for two hours. Now, I don't know about anyone else, but if my friends were robbing a supposedly empty store, I am not sticking around for two hours. Even if they had been running equipment out to the van, during those two hours, there were still large gaps of time where Andrew and Pierre were in the store, not coming out. And I don't know if Roberts knew if people kept walking in the store after the robbery started, but that would be my cue to leave because you are either getting caught or something more than you bargained for was going on. He also had a witness that had driven him home. He had left the van there for Andrews and Pierre. I don't know, that sounds like a situation where someone could have gotten railroaded and he's a much more sympathetic figure than Andrews or Pierre. Just a few days after William Andrews' execution, in August of 1992, Keith Leon Roberts self-deleted and this this honestly makes me sad. After serving 13 years in prison, after he was paroled, Robert spent the next five years living quietly and trouble-free in Chandler, Oklahoma. He had been working for an electronics company near Oklahoma City. While incarcerated, Roberts worked as an orderly and he spoke at junior high and high schools to try to turn young people away from crime. In 1988, his parole officer had said, he's doing real good. I think he's going to make it. I think there's more to that story than we'll ever know. Sherry Michelle Ainsley was only 18 years old when she was brutally murdered. She had just started working at the hi-fi shop, maybe been there for a week when this happened. She was engaged and had planned to tie the knot on August 5th, 1974. She was laid to rest at the Washington Heights Memorial Park in South Ogden. Carol Elaine Nesbitt, who was 52 at the time, was a respected member of the community. She was part of the LDS Church, the Weber County Medical Auxiliary, and had been a former member of the Junior League of Ogden. She was laid to rest at the Washington Heights Memorial Park in South Ogden. Stanley Oren Walker was just 20 years old when he was taken from us. He was an elder in the Ogden 10th LDS Ward and coached basketball for the ward. He was laid to rest at the Alta Rest Memorial Park in Ogden. Courtney Nesbitt was just 16 years old on April 22, 1974. He had been a bright science whiz who loved flying. Earlier in the day, Courtney, after having his shirt tail unceremoniously cut off by his instructor and nailed to the flight school wall, had completed his first solo flight right before entering the hi-fi shop. Oren Walker had had parental intuition nailed down. He had been just a worried father checking on his son. Despite everything that he went through that day, this lion-hearted powerhouse survived and he was instrumental in bringing justice for his son, Stanley. Oren and Courtney tried their best to move forward with their lives, but sadly, Oren passed away in 2000 at the age of 69, followed by Courtney in 2002. Bright science was Courtney had to drop out of college because of the brain damage he suffered, but he did manage to graduate high school after a grueling year of recovery from his injuries. Shortly after he had lost his wife to a brutal murder, and while his son was recovering in the hospital. Dr. Byron Nesbitt said, quote, no one was going to greet me and no one was going to be there. I went to the house and everything from one standpoint to another reminded me. Her house, her closet full of clothes, everything in the house was just her. It's just empty and my life is empty with it, end quote. The brutality and the cruelty of this crime it is just really hard for me to leave this right here so i'm gonna show those who don't know what happened to the drano pimp in magnum force is it a lighter note maybe not but it's a different note
Good day, sir. Is this car registered to you? Oh, yes, sir. This is my car. You must be new. You know who I am? I'll still have to see your license and registration, sir. I believe you were speeding coming across the bridge. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If I haven't pissed you off and you like this content, please like and subscribe. It is much appreciated. Be cool to yourself and be cool to others. And remember, don't hate the black, don't hate the white. If you get bitten, just hate the bite. Because I do care about what happens to you. Bye. <laughs>